Thanks for staying here uh, with us. We're going to conclude uh, this first day's event with our uh, last uh, profile in innovation in the day. I think it, uh, it certainly would have been an, an omission if we had talked about innovation without looking at some sort of uh, new technology uh, company. Uh, and so uh, we're very pleased to have an opportunity to hear from Jacob Sills, the CEO of Uptrust. As I think about what we just heard on the past panel, one of the areas where they identified for progress is the opportunity to use new forms of technology to solve some of the problems that we might have. They actually pointed to some really interesting possibilities in the eyewitness arena. I'd like to take you back to some of the issues and challenges that we talked about at the very beginning of the day today, thinking about pretrial detention. And one of the reasons that we are so reliant on money bail in the United States is the need to try and ensure that people reappear in court. Now, the question becomes, are there technological ways we could do that? And we think that Jacob uh, Sills has one of the answers, a very innovative one. So let's welcome uh, Jacob. And I should note that he is a alumnus of Penn uh, from uh, our uh, program over at Wharton. Uh, so Jacob, welcome. Uh, we're excited to hear from you. First, let me tell you what I'm not. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. I have no formal criminal justice background. Uh, I graduated from Wharton uh, with my MBA in 2014, which to uh, any law school students here means I'm basically a slacker who probably took advantage of great non-disclosure. But uh, before going back to business school, I worked in investment banking and private equity. And I did a lot of diligence. And I like to think I grew uh, a nose for bullshit. And so when I was graduating and starting to interview, um, I came across the issues of bail reform and the idea that bail was pretty unaffordable and resulted in a lot of people in jail, um, a real lot of people in jail. And so I started doing research while I was interviewing for other jobs. Um, I met with bail agents, spent time with defendants, public <laughs> defenders. Um, I even took 30 hours of bail agent training classes in California to really know the ins and outs. I was the only person with two degrees at that, uh, but it was interesting nonetheless. Um, eventually what I started doing was, there was not a lot of good data, as people talked about today, on bail decisions. So what I started doing was I started actually going to court, sitting in the San Francisco courthouse and New York, um, and taking notes and trying to see what the hell's going on, sort of like you used to do on baseball scores. And uh, what I found was pretty startling, and what that was was, you know, most of the defendants uh, had failed to appear before. In FTA, it's a term I'm going to use a lot today. And that FTA was a major predictor when people weren't showing up. So at this point, I was pretty hooked, and I thought there was this big inequity that I could help solve. And so I stopped interviewing and sort of spent full time looking at sort of pretrial justice reform. So today, I'm going to talk about why missed court states are a major contributor to inefficiencies. Uh, and since it's the end of the day and some things have been a little negative, uh, give you guys a solution that we're working on and that we've actually deployed in the field that's helping people show up to court. So one of the things is a lot of people miss court. Um, our estimates, because there's not great data, is between um, 10 and 20 percent, or around 1 million people. And why that matters, oh, why that matters is when you miss uh, appointments, uh, you go to jail. Um, you might go to jail immediately because of a bench warrant, 
uh, and you get picked up. This happens in California, about 100,000 arrests per year on bench warrants. Um, it's also sort of going to stick with you for the rest of your life. This is my attempt of a criminal justice joke with a scarlet FTA, uh, with Demi Moore, in, uh, um, which is to say, if you ever get an FTA and get a bench warrant, it's on your record. And so what happened is, and this I saw in the courtroom, um, judges would see someone and say, ah, you missed court. You know, the public defender would say, they haven't missed court in five years. And the prosecutor might say, well, they missed court six years ago. And that was going to influence the decision. And lastly, while today is going to focus on pretrial, uh, probation and parole also is an issue where if you miss a drug test, you miss a check-in with your parole officer, um, that's going to result in you going to jail. So um, as people talked about this a lot earlier today, so I won't belabor it. But the issue of pretrial incarceration is one of inequity. Um, as well as one of sort of fiscal irresponsibility, um, which is to say, as Megan mentioned earlier, you know, people are more likely to plead guilty even if innocent. People are more likely um, to actually be arrested for a future crime. Um, being in jail is not a fun place to be. There's a ton of literature on the trauma aspects of it. So if there's anyone we shouldn't put in a cage, we should keep them out of a cage. Um, second of all, bench warrants are really expensive. Um, it's not just the court inefficiencies of having a lot of missed court dates. Um, it's also the police. Those 100,000 cases in California, um, one police chief we're working with estimates that each one of those costs him $500. Um, you also have expenses related to prosecutors, public defenders, and lastly, incarceration. Um, people that don't have much money may have comorbidities. The health care costs of keeping people in jail is outrageous. So we think we can save over $10 billion by keeping people out of jail. So hopefully at this point, you know, you believe that this matters. Uh, and I guess the question then is, is, well, why are people missing court in the first place? So I don't know if anyone had any thoughts. Just shout them out. Why do you think low-income people miss court? They don't have money. All of those, all those are true, and some of them are up here. So one is they're bad at keeping a calendar. That's the truth for everyone. Some people have assistants. Some people have Google Calendar. It's a whole different slew of things. Um, mailed reminders. Um, there's a lot of literature. If you don't have money, you move around a lot in this country. Um, actually, one of the major reasons why you're going to move around in public housing is poor maintenance of your unit. So here we are. There are some counties. Um, where they're not telling you when you have to go to court, they're going to mail you a reminder at some point in the future, you're never going to get it. Um, transportation. Uh, you take for granted if you live in the inner city or like in New York City, it's pretty easy. There's a subway. You also take for granted if you own your own car. Um, I was at a talk the other day, and to get from one part of the Atlanta metro area to the other part, you had to connect on two or three different forms of public transportation, and it took two and a half hours. Uh, that's a lot. Um, also, mental health issues, um, physical health issues, um, a lot of different things. Um, what we also really found, which was the most interesting part of our research, was not just the organizational issues. And those are the things that really appeal uh, and apply to people in this room, because these are the things that you think about. But there's also a lot of social and emotional issues. Um, one was the failure to understand the benefits of attendance. Uh, I volunteer in prison uh, with a group called The Five Ventures. And one of the things I always ask is, like, did you ever miss court? And one guy the other day told me he missed court 17 times. And when I asked, well, what happened? He goes, well, I know that was wrong now, but I just didn't see the point of showing up. Um, other things, uh, poor customer service. And this system works a lot better if you have money versus if you don't. And I'm not talking about the difference between like first class and economy plus. Like this is rapidly different experiences. So in New Orleans, for example, everyone needs to show up in the morning. Now you show up in the morning. If you've got a private attorney, you're going to go first and see your case. If you don't, you're in the queue. If by the time the judge wants to leave at 2 PM, you haven't been heard, well, you're out of luck. You got to come back. So that's a whole day that maybe you took time off of work that's been wasted. And that's just, I just thought about if I had to go through that experience, I'd be pissed off. So why are we putting other people through this? 
And all this stuff sort of funnels down to sort of fear, confusion, distrust, which is to say, if people don't know the outcome of something or they're nervous to do it, they're just less likely to comply. But we just described probably 10 or 15 reasons why people are not showing up. But one thing we didn't discuss was flee, flight risk, which is the major risk that people are trying to understand when they're deciding whether to let someone in or out. And as you said, they have no place to go. These are people who don't have the money to flee even if they wanted to. Uh, I read a recent uh, survey that said like 80% of Americans have less than 10,000 bucks in their bank account. 80%, basically the same figure, are eligible for public defense. So you tell me, if you can't afford an attorney and you're found to be indigent, like how are you going to Mexico? And so... Most people can't afford to get to court. It's not something you put up with. That's very fair. And we'll, we'll, we'll describe how we solved that. The, um, and so what I saw was sort of interesting, and this is what I was seeing firsthand, which was there was this massive misinformation and confusion from prosecutors and judges. And by the way, it's not really their fault they're flying blind. They don't have the data. But what they do is they conflate attendance risk with flight risk. So in reality, this is what happens. But everyone watches a lot of, lot of, of Law & Order, and they think this is what happens. But those are very, very different risks. So um, the one thing I did find that was sort of interesting was you know, when we do our work in different counties, the first thing we ask people is, what's your FTA rate? How many people aren't showing up to court? Um, no one really knows that that well, uh, which is a big problem. So one of the things we're going to talk about today and what I'm trying to solve for is just getting more data on these issues. So um, we did something very rare in the criminal justice system. We asked defendants what they wanted. And what we found was most people don't require pretrial supervision what they require is pretrial assistance. And those are different things, and it seems sort of radical, because this morning people threw out terms like pretrial services, and that these are the answers. But a lot of pretrial services are generally low-level, pe people accused of low-level felonies, or felonies themselves. And so what you have this problem is, is you have this allocation of resources to things like electronic monitoring and getting people to check in and to supervise them when they just want a little bit of help. And this sort of brought me, when we were doing research, to someone in the DC Public Defender's Office, this sort of mythical feature, uh, figure. And uh, he would keep the spreadsheet that had all of his clients' phone numbers. He would call them, call their families. He would buy people lunch if they were hungry. He'd give them a ride to court if they needed it. Um, and most interestingly, none of his clients missed court. And so, aha. This, system, this problem is solvable. And so um, we, what we realized, and this is my partner Eli who's not here today, who's the CTO, what we realized is we need to take what this great public defender was doing and basically codify it in a way, in a computer program, um, that would allow public defenders and different people in the criminal justice system to provide good service, but also help defendants everywhere at a reasonable cost. So I'll run you through an example of how we view the world versus how the system does. So someone gets arrested with a suspended license, which is basically, I've learned, uh, code word for their poor, because um, they probably haven't paid a fine or a fee. Now, he has a child, he's employed, he recently moved. These are good things. This means he's probably a zero flight risk. But how we started thinking about it, how we're trying to flip the script of thinking about you know, defendants first, is he may need help with this child's care, because maybe he's raising a kid alone, um, he might need to ask time off work, and he may not receive mail if he's moved. Um, and so what we sort of launched is, we then thought about is like, well, then how do we do this in practice? And we sort of thought about two schools of thought. One was, as someone mentioned today, how DC pretrial services has solved it. And you know what? They do a good job. But they, what they didn't say, no offense, is they spend $60 million a year and it's federally funded. So, uh, and they only work with about 10 to 20,000 defendants a year, which is really expensive. Uh, and to be honest, if we could go do that, that's fine. But a uh, uh, brief pause is, uh, you know, I live in San Francisco. If you have an idea for Snapchat for cats, 
Uh, you can raise a few million bucks if you want to reform the criminal justice system. Eh, we'll wait till you, uh, you know, get to a few million dollars in revenue. Um, so uh, we couldn't really do this sort of approach, which is just throw a lot of money at the situation. At the same time, we didn't want to do all tech either. Um, something that people forget, especially in Silicon Valley, is they think, you know, just throw things at the wall. You know, Facebook, you know, move fast, break things. But these are people's lives. And if you went to a full technology solution, uh, could it be a little cheaper? Yeah, uh, but it also had a lot of issues. And so what we realized was we needed to do something in the middle, which was to say, work with people, in this case, public defenders, where we could sort of leverage them in their free time, help make them more efficient, and therefore bring some tech to their life, which would make the system more efficient. So this is sort of how our system works at a high level. And when I describe uptrust, there's sort of the what and the how. The what is, we sort of sit in the middle and we basically take information from public defenders. Um, this is a lot of stuff that comes through on an application for public defense. So their phone number, uh, maybe their last address. We don't care about things like social security numbers and sensitive info. We add to the application a few multiple choice questions. Do you have a kid under the age of 10? Um, do you have a job or any kind of daily obligation? Maybe it's elder care. Um, how are you planning to get to court? Um, these types of things, we then tie into a case management system to get court dates because they do move around. Um, and then we send a series of messages. But what's important about us is we don't just send one-way messages. We automate the first message um, to the people awaiting trial. And then if they have questions, they can write back. And then we take that message and we route that to the public defender or the social worker working with them. And that's really critical because of the how. Um, what we sort of think about the system is we said, look, if we're going to do this thing, and my partner was the lead engineer of OKCupid, so he had a lot of different opportunities to do stuff too, was, you know, let's try to do things the right way. Uh, let's just try to, you know, you, give, you get what you give. And let's try to make this as enjoyable of experience for defendants and see if this actually improves outcomes. And so um, I, I, one example I thought about with service was no one who using our service uh, that was a defendant wanted to be there. You know, this is not like going to the mall. Like, even if you're innocent, guilty, it doesn't matter. It's unpleasant. But at the same time, I thought about, like, when your entree is late, a good waiter makes it all better. And so it's all about service. And so we just wanted to put a better spin on this and make people feel a lot more comfortable. And so, for example, we only use first names. We don't say Mr. Sills. We don't call, you know, case X, Y, and Z. Um, we say please. We say thank you. If we're going to remind you about taking time off of work, we tell you that if you don't go, you might go to jail. But you know, we make sure people are in control of their own lives. We give them, we're, we're not big brother. We're really there to help. Um, so to engage defendants, we use text message. And um, it's the best way to reach people today. It's how low income individuals communicate. It's how everyone communicates who's young, to be honest. Uh, I even talk to my mom via text message now all the time. Um, and text messages have a higher open rate. Um, the one thing I'll also say here is, We'll talk to court systems and public defenders' offices, and what they'll say is, well, we just want to do robocalls. And that's when you, know, you get a, an automated phone call from an unknown number to, that speaks to you in a weird voice. Um, the one thing I'll say there is, no one likes that. I don't pick up the number if I don't know it, so I don't know how we expect other people to. Um, so uh, this is sort of how we start messages. You know, we try to be very friendly. Um, we tell people, like, if there's child care available at the courthouse, where they can find it. Uh, right now, even this is a San Francisco address. In San Francisco, like, they don't tell defendants if they have kids that there's child care available. They just have to, like, magically figure that out for themselves, which is problematic. Um, and here are some conversations. They might be too small. But the first one is, you know, um, people are economical with words on text message. And they can also be positive. So here's someone saying, have a blessed day. Um, here's someone who's acknowledging their nervousness. Um, you know, this is now an opportunity for the public defender to support them. Um, sorry, it is pretty small. Um, but, you know, people have the jitters. 
And being able to acknowledge that you're nervous and having a voice and not sending something back and being like, oh, don't respond to this message, is eliciting this humanization in the criminal justice system that's getting really good results, which I'll touch on in a second. And lastly, and this is probably the stuff that like keeps me coming back for more, which is to say, uh, here's an example. We launched in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania in January. And uh, the day after we launched, this message came in to a public defender alerting them of a funeral they had to attend and that they wouldn't be in court. Um, I spoke to the attorney when I was up there. And he said, you know what? I hadn't had a chance to speak to this client. If I didn't get this message, tomorrow they were going to get a bench warrant in a Lucerne County that usually ends up being three days in jail when they get picked up. So one of the things that was interesting is if you can communicate with your public defender and tell them you're going to not be there, the judges are actually surprisingly cool with it. They're like, hey, reschedule. But you got to have that communication. No communication, you end up in jail. So um, jumping ahead to improvement, uh, it's been awesome. So I'll just be completely honest. Like we take what was about 80% in our three jurisdictions that we're currently operating in, and I'll describe the new ones we're going to start in the next month or two. Um, and now we're getting 96% of people to court. Um, that is for every 100 defendants, and there's a lot, 16 bench warrants that are going to be avoided. So we're having a massive improvement. Um, What's also been really interesting, and so it's not just all made up, is engagement. Um, about 40% of our clients are texting back. And once again, this is unprompted. Also, a very big departure from how criminal justice thinks. We're not telling people they need to tell us we're coming. They just write back, OK, and thank you. Transportation plans. And now Megan's going to throw up on me because I'm going to uh, you know, confuse association with causation. But like, what's been really interesting is in Richmond, uh, California, our first site, um, Go Bay Area, um, uh, no one who said they were going to drive their own car has missed court. Now, that's a lot of issues of poverty, but once again, what we're starting to do here is collect this data, and now what we're thinking about doing is doing a partnership with maybe Uber and saying, hey, if we know that someone lives in an area with crappy bus service and we know they don't know how to get to court, let's spend the 20 or 40 bucks to get them there instead of the thousands of dollars incarcerating them. Um, I don't want this to seem all positive. There are roadblocks. The two major ones are IT staffs. Uh, people generally say, I get it. They like it. The technology is not difficult, even though the systems are tough. But IT staffs are generally like, this is new. This is not in my job description. I'm not sure. Also, government don't like investing in cost savings, which is uh, much to my chagrin as a taxpayer. But uh, it's true. So if you're selling you know, revenue from red light cameras, people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're saying, hey, you can cut out your jail budget, uh, some sheriff is going to say, I'm not so sure. So what's next for us, because I'm short on time, is we're expanding, hopefully, to 15 counties. Uh, that's including starting a, um, I hope I'm allowed to say this, uh, uh, with Dean, who's here um, in Montgomery County, um, to do a study of our of our work, which is to say like a true randomized control trial of reminders and connect people to services to make sure it's not just a guy with a sport coat telling you it works. Um, we're also going to be starting in Baltimore um, in June or July, which is going to be very interesting for us as well. Um, also developing a probation and parole product. Uh, it's a bit of run before we walk, but we're getting a lot of inbound interest from people who are telling us about horror stories of people on parole and probation missing job trainings, missing court appointments, and they're ending up in jail and prison too. And it's a lot of the same issues we're solving for. And lastly, and this is where I think we can be transformative, um, the system is currently thinking about risk. And it's, are you good or are you bad? If I'm going to sentence you, how do I use machine learning to give you the right sentence? And no one's thinking about, hold on, what do people need to get on the straight and narrow? Or what do people need? to make these kinds of appointments. And we're collecting data will soon be in a lot of the largest cities in America. We're actually creating a first scalable platform that's going to do this. We collect this type of data. We'll be able to run experiments. And over time, what we hope to do is change that conversation. Someone comes into your courtroom and you're a judge. Maybe Jacob Sills gets just text reminders. And maybe John gets a full-time social worker. We're making a data deal, because you know John, but uh, we're making, but we're going to start making data-driven decisions around how do we help people the most. Um, 
so my last sort of slides and takeaways are flight risk is not the same of attendance risk. Uh, if you're a judge or a prosecutor here, you probably already know this, but really think about this before you sort of set high bail or ask for high bail. Um, also, this is a win-win-win. It's going to save taxpayers dollars. It helps courts and police focus on what's important to them. You know, police officers we talk to don't want to chase down, you know, a mother of two because of a bench warrant. They want to chase bad guys. And lastly, you know, from a fairness perspective, you know, keep people out of jail who don't need to be there. So one thing we hear a lot of is, ah, this would be great, but it's not the right time. Or, you know, um, I'm not sure if the DA will like this. Or we don't have a lot of budget. I mean, we work for really, really, really darn cheap because we want to see this thing happen. So just do it. Uh, every day, thousands of people are put in cages that don't need to be. Uh, I don't care if you care about this because that's wrong or you care about it because that's a really big waste of tax dollars, just do it. So thank you very much.